Welcome back to Making Sense of the Christian Faith. This week we're going to talk about Chapter 5, God Concarne, the Incarnation. Last week we focused on much of the Old Testament story, which revolved around God's making of a covenant and giving a law, and in this way establishing a new community through the people of Israel, a community through which God intended to bless the whole world. Now the rest of the Old Testament focuses on this tumultuous relationship between God and Israel, as Israel regularly tries, but ultimately fails to live up to God's expectations and hopes, and as God regularly pursues Israel, sometimes through warning, sometimes through judgment, sometimes through words of, of comfort and restoration, always seeking to restore that relationship with Israel that God established in the first place. Now in time, after several centuries of this tumultuous up and down relationship, the prophets will begin to look forward to a new and different kind of relationship with God, one that isn't based on the old covenant and old law, but rather one that is based in a new covenant and a new law, a law, the prophet Jeremiah says, will be written on our hearts, a law and covenant that even fallen humanity can't break. Now Christians confess that God establishes this new relationship in and through Jesus Christ. Christians also confess that in Jesus, God became one of us, fully and completely. Now, although most of us take this confession of faith for granted, the church actually wrestled with what this meant for several centuries before coming to any kind of agreement. Now, throughout those centuries of discussion and even division, there were two primary concerns. The first was, if we say Jesus is God, the way John does at the beginning of his gospel, do you remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? If we say that Jesus the Word is God, then are we suddenly worshiping more than one God? It took Christians a long time to settle that, and out of those discussions came something we now call the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, we're not in this course going to spend a lot of time with the Trinity, but what's important to recognize is that what Christians decided was that, in fact, the biblical witness testifies to a single God that we experience or is made manifest to us in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the reason it was important to confess that Jesus, as part of the Trinity, is fully God is so that we can trust the promises God makes to us in and through Jesus. If, some early church leaders said, if Jesus is only an angel, or a demigod, or a superhero, or super mortal. That means that there was a time before Jesus began, and there'll be a time after Jesus comes to an end. And if that's true, if Jesus is part of the created world that eventually will be uncreated, then can we trust the promises that God is making to us through Jesus? So church leaders like Athanasius thought it was vitally important to, to confess that in Jesus we receive God really God, so that we can trust the promises that God makes us to us through Jesus. The second concern was a more basic or human one. That is, it just doesn't seem godlike to talk about God becoming human. If you think particularly about the other notions of God that were floating around the world at this time, particularly Greco-Roman notions, think about what you remember of Greek philosophy. God is the unmoved mover. God is the first cause. God is behind all things. Then it's hard to imagine or square those ideas with God as sort of distant and perfect with a baby being born in all the messy, mucky ways that all babies are born. In fact, at one point, that very analogy sparked a controversy between two early church leaders, one by the name of Marcion, who simply said he cannot imagine God coming to the world in such a messy way. And another, Tertullian, saying, in fact, but how else were we born, right? We also are born in pain and struggle and suffering into a broken world. And if we can imagine God in Jesus, then we know that God knows us, knows our ups and downs, knows our failures and struggles, knows our triumphs and setbacks. God knows what it is to be human. And so Tertullian and others affirm that, in fact, in Jesus, we get the whole of God because by confessing that, we know God knows us and, in fact, that God loves us profoundly.
One of the early church leaders I mentioned earlier, a bishop by the name of Athanasius, had a nice way of summing this up. Athanasius said that because of Jesus, we know that wherever we may go in this life, God and Jesus has already been there. And where Jesus is now, we will someday also be. That's a pretty great promise.